Christ, the hope of glory, in whom there's life and hope for you. Open your heart, receive from Him. Christ is calling you, brother, receive your And we may be seated. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8. The Bible says, Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm speaking on the subject, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This verse of scripture does show us that positionally, those that believe in Christ Jesus are actually in him. They are living in him. Positionally, if you are a believer, in Christ Jesus, if you are born again, you are said to be in Christ. Amen. Somebody shout, I am, I am in Christ. Colossians 2 and verse number 6, Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6, the Bible says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You are in him. You are in him. You are in Christ. Can we have this in NIV? Glory to God. So then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in, in, inside, in, in him, in him, in him. So those of us that are born again, Live in a sphere called Christ. A sphere called Christ. A sphere called Christ. Somebody shout, I am, I am in Christ. And there is a kind of life expected of everyone who is in Christ. There is a kind of life expected of those of us that live in him. Those of us that live in him. And so what we are discussing today is really about what life is like in Christ. Life in Christ Jesus. How is it like? And we are looking at very salient issues that are usually not discussed in the church. And in this service, we want to start by looking at an aspect of life in Christ called sacrifice. Somebody shout sacrifice. Life in Christ is a life of sacrifice. It is a life of sacrifice. As a matter of fact, let us be reminded that Christianity is a product of sacrifice. The Bible speaking in John chapter 3 and verse 16, common verse, John chapter 3 and verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says God gave his 
Only begotten son. Only. Only. And Jesus is the foundation of the Christian life. And he had to come as a product of sacrifice. Because God had to give his only begotten son. His only begotten son. His only begotten son. Is that 1 Peter chapter 5? I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lamb, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, here it is, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Without sacrifice, there is no Christianity. Christianity is a product of sacrifice. And that sacrifice is Christ himself. That's the sacrifice of Christianity. Praise the name of Jesus. And everyone who is in Christ Jesus must live sacrificially. We must live sacrificially. We must live sacrificially. Somebody shall sacrifice. The Bible speaking in Luke chapter 9 and verse number 23. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 23. It says, Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, what you see in that verse is a picture of sacrifice. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. In other words, if you are in Christ, it is expected of you to live sacrificially. To live sacrificially. To live sacrificially. By doing what? Number one. He says deny yourself. That's the first dimension of sacrifice. I want us to look at here very quickly. Deny yourself. Self-denial. Denial of self. That is the first line of sacrifice. Because your Bible will tell you that you cannot serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will be loyal to to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon there simply means money. The point is you cannot serve two masters. In every person there is what we call self. Self. And self is usually naturally opposed to Christ. Self. What is self? Self is that thing in a person that makes him think and believe that he or she deserves to be treated in a certain way. That's self. That thing in a person that makes him or her to think that he or she deserves a certain level of attention, a certain level of recognition, a certain level of respect. Self is that thing in you. That sometimes reacts when not 
when you are not treated as expected, it reacts. It becomes angry, sad, disappointed. Inquisitive, why, why, why are they treating me like this and not like this? That thing in you that makes you think that at your level, you don't deserve to drive certain types of cars. No, 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 not at our level. That's self. Self. Self is the sum total of everything gainful that you have. Your education is part of self. Your status is part of self. Your money is part of self. Your marriage is part of self. Your property is part of self. That thing inside of you that makes you believe it makes you be convinced that you deserve honor, attention, attention, honor, attention. That thing inside of you that makes you believe you must be treated in a certain way. Jesus says, if you are going to enjoy me, <laughs> if you are going to enjoy life in me, as my follower, you must, as a matter of priority, deny yourself. Because in your interaction with me, as you continue to live in me, I will begin to make demands on you that will contradict the expectations of yourself. Therefore, should I give you an instruction to do something that seems to contradict yourself, you better deny self and follow my instructions. Jesus may call upon you to do something and self will be telling you that it is not convenient. Not now. What will people say? That thing inside of you that makes you ask what will people say every time you want to obey God it is called self and Jesus is telling us in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 it says if we are going to walk with him successfully one of the things we have to do is to deny self deny self what is to deny self? To deny self simply means to exercise self-control. To exercise self-control. It means to embrace selflessness. Selflessness in life. Setting aside your selfish interests for the sake of Christ. Setting aside your self-interests. This is what I would have preferred to do, but doing this will contradict the values of Christ. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. Thus, the first dimension of sacrifice expected of everyone who is in Christ. Life in Christ is a life of sacrifice. And the first line of sacrifice is denier of self. Denier of self. Please, I want us to look at Luke chapter 14 and verse 20. Here is a picture of what I'm talking about. Somebody was invited to a celebration, everything was ready. the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of you.
He received the invitation. But look at what he says. He says, I have married a wife. It's not a bad thing to marry a wife. He says, on this basis, because I have married a wife, I cannot come. This is an example of someone who is in Christ Jesus, but who is not willing to deny self. Jesus is saying, come, because I want you to do this. The man says, ah, ah, can't you see I have married a wife? We are still romancing now. I'm not going to come. So in Luke chapter 9 and verse number 62, Luke chapter 9 and verse number 62, Jesus said, now hear this, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It says, if you put your hand on the plow and you keep looking back, looking, you are not fit for the kingdom. You need to be single-minded in your walk with Jesus. Single-minded. Single eye. Do we call it a single eye? You must have a single eye. So many people are double-eyed. When it comes to their walk with Jesus, they look at Jesus, but there is another eye looking elsewhere. If you're going to enjoy life in Christ, you must be sacrificial in your approach. And the first line of sacrifice is what? Denial of self. Please, if we're on the same page, can I hear a shout of them? Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Give it to me in good news translation. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Do not do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast. <laughs> but be humble toward one another, always considering others better than yourselves. Verse number 4. And... Look out for one another's interests, not just for your own interests. Self-denial. NIV, the same passage, verses 3 to 4, NIV. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Verse number 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Praise the Lord. The second dimension of sacrifice that Jesus talks about in that Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 is the sacrifice of cross-bearing. He says, this fellow must take up his cross daily. The sacrifice of cross bearing. Cross bearing. Life in Christ is a life of sacrifice. The first dimension of sacrifice is the sacrifice of denial of self. Number two is the sacrifice of carrying your cross daily. Carrying your cross daily. It is not a pleasant thing to carry one's cross. It wasn't at least for Jesus Christ. And it's amazing because the master does not say let him carry my cross. No. He says whoever wants to follow me let him carry his own cross. And he says, that must be done daily to signify what? Consistency and constancy. says, it must be done consistently and constantly on a continuous basis, on a daily basis. He says, let him take up his cross daily. Let him take up his cross daily. In Luke chapter 14 and verse number 27, 
Luke chapter 14 and verse number 27. He said, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross. It's not everyone claiming to follow Christ who is bearing his cross. It's not everyone who is bearing the cross. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 38. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 38. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Glory to God. What is to bear your cross? Because it says you must carry your cross. Take up, bear your cross. What does it mean to bear your cross? Simply put, to bear one's cross is to endure suffering for the sake of Christ. It is the experience of suffering for Christ's sake. Enduring suffering. So when the suffering comes to you because you are a Christian, you endure it. You don't backslide. You don't cut corners. You don't compromise. You endure the suffering. You go through the suffering. You are willing to suffer. And you go ahead to suffer because of Christ. That is to carry your cross, my friend. Cross simply means pain, suffering. You see, life in Christ is one that many times attracts adversity. Attacks. Adversity. Attacks. Persecutions. And that is the cross Jesus is talking about. That must be born daily. The discipline of remaining a follower of Christ. The discipline of upholding the standards and expectations of Christ. So that you don't lose your relationship with him. That's the cross. Suffering, number two, the discipline of upholding the expectations and demands of Christ in order for you not to lose your salvation or your relationship with him. So the cross has the suffering side, which has to do with you enduring the suffering, and number two, the discipline of holding on to the practices that make it possible for you to continue in the faith. That willingness to suffer in conveniences for the sake of Christ. You see, that fellow didn't want to be inconvenienced. I mean, that fellow of Luke chapter 14 and verse 20. I have married a wife. Why are you in inconveniencing me? Are you not married yourself? Don't you know what we do when we are newly married? He didn't want to be inconvenienced. But the discipline of enduring inconvenience it may not be the suffering of pain, adversity, and persecution, but the suffering of being inconvenienced because Jesus has demanded that certain things must be done at a time when it is naturally not convenient for that kind of exercise. I don't know if I'm talking to the right people. Can I hear a shout of Emma? Cross-bearing, we also mean to accept whatever may come for the sake 
of the Lord. To accept whatever may come for the sake of the Lord. To accept whatever may come. And many times the things that may come are not very comforting or convenient, palatable. But accepting whatever may come for the sake of the Lord, the Lord that you have come to accept, the Lord in whom you live, is what we mean by carrying or taking up or bearing your cross. If you understand what I'm saying, shout hallelujah. Let's look at a few scriptures here very quickly. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. The Bible says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. I pray that in life you will not lack opportunity. In the name of Jesus. Verse 11. Some people, the Philippian brothers, had sent supplies to the Apostle Paul. Okay? And so he's writing to commend, to appreciate. You see, when somebody does something good to you, please learn to say thank you. Amen. It pays to say thank you. When somebody does something good to you, don't say, eh, socks. Do they know how many socks I have? Ah, 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 ah. Somebody said that to be ungrateful is to be a great fool. It shows that your brain is not working. Now, let's get back to verse number 10. So he's appreciating. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. You brought me supplies. Now, verse 11, the, he's making some clarifications in order to make sure that the Philippian brethren do not misunderstand what he is saying. He says, not that I speak in regard to need. I'm appreciating your supplies, but I'm not speaking in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. He says, it's not that we are praying. And hoping and cajoling you and coercing you to say that maybe the Philippian brothers will send us, will send us some supplies. No! We were okay in our need because I, Paul, have learned in whatever state I am to be content. To be content. Verse 12. I know. How to be abased. In other words, I know what it means to live in need. I know what it means to lack. I also know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. And do you know why he was doing this? For the sake of Christ. Because Paul was a man with great accolades. When you read Philippians chapter 3. He was, he was a doctor of laws. He was a big man. But he says, I have learned both to be full. There are times when in our ministry we will be full. Everything is available, he says. But there are also times when we'll be hungry. We'll go days without eating. Not because we are fasting, but because there is nothing to eat. Preaching Christ, the hope of glory. In whom there's life and hope for you. Open your heart, receive. Christ is calling you, brother, receive your hope. Christ is calling you, sister, receive.